Kissing number problem. Stacking spheres sounds simple until you actually try it. Put two balls together and you get a pair. Add a third and you've got a little cluster. But then comes the big question. How many spheres can touch one single sphere at the same time? That number is called the kissing number. Not because the spheres are romantic, but because they're all pressed up against each other like fruit in a supermarket bin. In one dimension, the answer is easy. A line of marbles can only kiss two neighbors, one on each side. In two dimensions, like coins on a table, a circle can be surrounded by six others. By the time you hit three dimensions, things get messy. Mathematicians argued for centuries whether the number was 12 or 13 until it was finally proven in the 1950s. A sphere in 3D space can have exactly 12 snug neighbors. Then someone asked, what about four dimensions? Now, you can't picture that in real life, but in math, it just means adding another direction on top of length, width, and height. That's where the problem is. Past three dimensions, nobody really knows the kissing number for sure. And this isn't just trivia. The same math shows up in real-world stuff, like how to pack data into computers without wasting space, or how to send signals so they don't get mixed up. So cracking the kissing number in higher dimensions could actually change how technology works. Twin prime conjecture. Prime numbers are already strange, but twin primes take that weirdness to another level. A twin prime is just two prime numbers that sit right next to each other with only one number in between. 11 and 13 are twins, so are 41 and 43. They're like siblings who refuse to live far apart. The question is simple to ask, but hard to answer. Do these twin pairs go on forever? Most mathematicians hmm. think they do, but proving it has turned out to be one of the hardest puzzles in math. And the higher up the number line you go, the harder it gets. Twin primes become rarer. You can go for a long stretch without seeing any, then suddenly stumble on a pair hiding in the middle of nowhere. For centuries, nobody could get real progress on this. Then in 2013, a quiet, little-known mathematician named Yi Tang Zheng stunned huh? everyone. He showed that there are infinitely many prime numbers that sit fairly close together, no more than 70 million apart. 70 million sounds big, but it was the first serious breakthrough in hundreds of years. Since then, other mathematicians have chipped away at Zhang's results, closing the gap from 70 million down to just a few hundred. But the finish line is still far off. To prove the twin prime conjecture once and for all, that gap needs to shrink all the way down to two. If that ever happens, we'd finally know for sure that twin primes never run out. Knot theory, the unknotting problem. Everyone knows knots. You tie your shoelaces, you twist up a fishing line, you pull your headphones out of your pocket and find them in a hopeless mess. Knots are basically everywhere, but mathematicians don't think about the string or rope itself. They think about the shape it makes in space. Here's the puzzle. How do you know if a knot is truly tied or if it's just a twist that can actually be undone in one clean loop? This is what they call the unknotting problem. Imagine you're staring at a big tangle of yarn on your desk. It looks impossible, but sometimes that knot is only an illusion. If you pulled it the right way, it could slip apart into nothing. The hard part is proving which ones are real knots and which ones only look bad. Over the last few decades, computers have been brought in to help. There are programs that can check certain knots and even show animations of them slowly being pulled apart. The trouble is speed. As knots get more complicated, the time it takes to check them grows unbelievably fast. So even a slightly bigger knot can take a computer practically forever to solve. For some tangles, a computer would need to keep running longer than the age of the universe universe just to give you an answer. The pi plus e problem. Pi and e are two of the most famous numbers in math. Pi shows up whenever circles are involved. It's basically the ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter. E is more hidden, but just as important. It pops up in growth, decay, and compound interest. Both are unusual because they're what mathematicians call transcendental numbers, meaning you can't trap them inside any neat little equation. They go on forever, and they don't fit into math's usual patterns. With numbers this famous, you'd expect we'd know everything about them by now. But here's the surprise. We don't even know what happens when you add them together. Is pi plus e another transcendental number? Or is it algebraic? Which means it does come from some nice, clean equation. Nobody has ever been able to prove it. And it's not just addition. Mathematicians are also stuck on pi times e, pi divided by e, and other simple combinations. On their own, both numbers are well studied, but once you put them in the same equation, math suddenly goes silent. You can plug them into a computer and calculate pi plus e to trillions of digits, but that still doesn't give a proof. It's like reading millions of pages of a book without knowing whether the story has an ending. These two constants are so well known, yet together they're still a mystery. Birch and Swinnerton Dyer Conjecture Some math problems don't just twist your brain as much as they sound intimidating from the name. 
The Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture is one of those, but underneath, it's about something surprisingly visual, elliptic curves. If you draw the equation on a graph, you get smooth loops, almost shaped like stretched rubber bands. These curves aren't just pretty shapes, they're used in online security to keep data safe, and they connect back to prime numbers, the same tricky numbers that drive so many of math's biggest mysteries. The big question is that everybody is wondering is how many solutions do these curves have? A solution here means a point on the curve where the numbers work out neatly. Sometimes there are only a handful of them, and other times there might be infinitely many. Birch and Swinnerton noticed a strange pattern in the 1960s when they ran early computer tests. They guessed that by looking at something called an L function, you could actually predict how many solutions a curve would have. That guess became their famous conjecture. Decades later, the puzzle is still wide open. Even proving small examples can take years of effort. That's why it was chosen as one of the official Millennium Prize problems. This is a list of seven of the hardest math challenges in the world. Solve it and you not only earn a million dollar prize, but also secure your name in math history. Euler Mascheroni Constant, Gamma. Some numbers get all the attention, like pi or e, but then there's the Euler Mascheroni Constant, usually called Gamma. It shows up in equations everywhere, yet almost nobody outside of math has heard it. Its value starts at about 0.577, and then the decimals just keep going forever without ever repeating. Gamma comes from comparing two simple ideas, adding fractions, and taking logarithms. Imagine you add 1, plus 1 half, plus 1 third, plus 1 fourth, and you keep going like that forever. At the same time, you track the natural logarithm of the same number of steps. The two races grow side by side, and the tiny gap between them starts to settle down to a fixed value. That settled value is gamma. Here's the strange part, we don't actually know what kind of number it is. Some numbers are rational, which means you can write them as neat as fractions, like 42 over 13. Others are irrational, like pi, which never fits into a fraction. With gamma, nobody really knows. Mathematicians have calculated hmm. it to billions of digits, but no proof has ever shown whether it belongs on the rational side or the irrational side. Lonely Runner Conjecture Think of a round track with a bunch of people running at different speeds. They all start together, but each one pretty much runs at their own pace. Some are fast, some are slow, and before long, they spread out around the track. The question is simple. Will every runner eventually find a moment where they are far enough from the others that they're running alone? That's the lonely runner conjecture. With one runner, the answer is obvious. They're always alone. With two runners, it's easy to check. For three, four, five, six, and even seven runners, mathematicians have proven it works. At some point, each runner is guaranteed their lonely stretch. But once you add an eighth runner, the problem turns into a mystery no one has solved. What makes it interesting is how easy it is to explain without using heavy math. You just need to picture a few people moving at different speeds around a track. Still, under that simple setup, the problem links to timing, distance, and how numbers loop around cycles. It's the kind of puzzle that looks like it should be solved with a bit of patience, yet it's resisted mathematicians for decades. Colat's conjecture. Pick any whole number. Doesn't matter if it's tiny or massive, if it's even, split it in half, if it's odd, triple it and tack on one. Then take the result and do the same thing again, and again. Before long, you'll notice a strange pattern. No matter where you start, the sequence always crashes into the same loop. 4, 2, 1, 4, 2, 1, forever. Try it with 10 and you'll see it quickly shrink down into the cycle. Try it with something messy like 27 and it goes completely haywire first, shooting up and down through more than 100 steps, but it still can't escape the trap. Mathematicians have pushed this with computers into the billions, and every single time the numbers give up and spiral down to that little three-step loop. And here's the kicker, nobody can prove why. The Colatz conjecture has been around since the 1930s, and despite how easy it is to explain, there's still no proof it always works. It might be that somewhere, hidden in the endless forest of numbers, there's a stubborn one that never falls back. Navier stokes existence and smoothness. Water seems easy until you try to explain it with math. The equations for how fluids move are called the Navier Stokes equations. They're behind everything, from weather forecasts to ocean waves, airplane design, and even how smoke curls off a candle. On paper, the equations look neat, but in real life, calm water can suddenly turn wild, and the math struggles to keep up. The big mystery is about two things. First, can we be sure these equations always have a solution, no matter 
of the situation? Second, are those solutions always smooth, without sudden breaks or explosions? If the answer is yes, the math works fine. If the answer is no, the equations could blow up and stop making sense. Picture a gentle river that suddenly crashes into rapids. The same equations are supposed to explain both, but no one has proved they never spiral into something impossible, like an infinite whirlpool hidden inside the math. Computers can test certain cases and show patterns, but that's not the same as proving it for every possible flow, shape, or push of liquid. This isn't just a math puzzle. A full solution would sharpen the science behind weather predictions, engine design, and even climate models. It's another tough problem that was made in one of the Millennium Prize problems, with a million dollars waiting for whoever cracks it. Perfect cuboid problem. If you go ahead and picture an ordinary box, maybe something like a shoe box, then each corner has three edges meeting, the length, the width, and the height. Now, on every flat side of the box, you can also draw a diagonal line from one corner to the opposite. And if you look inside the box, there's one more, the space diagonal, the longest line running straight through the middle from one corner to the opposite corner. Here's the puzzle. Could there be a box where every single one of those lengths is a whole number? The edges, the diagonals across the faces, and even that long space diagonal inside? A box like that would be called a perfect cuboid. We know part of the idea works. Mathematicians have built Euler bricks, boxes where the edges and face diagonals all come out as whole numbers. But nobody has ever managed to make the inside diagonal a whole number too. No matter how far they search, it always breaks down. Computers have tested billions of possibilities looking for one, and still nothing. Some experts think a perfect cuboid would have sides so huge that even today's fastest machines couldn't find it. Others think it simply doesn't exist at all. But until someone proves it, the question is stuck in limbo. Continuum Hypothesis Infinity isn't a single number you can just point to. There are different sizes of it. Start with the integers, one, two, three, and so on, and you've got a countable infinity. You could, in theory, line them up and never run out, but the real numbers, like the decimals between zero and one, form a bigger infinity. They're uncountable. Even if you listed numbers forever, you'd miss almost all of them. That's where the continuum hypothesis comes in. It's basically asking, is there a size of infinity that sits in between the infinity of whole numbers and the infinity of the number line? Bigger than counting numbers, but smaller than all the decimals. You'd think there hmm. should be something in the middle, but nobody's ever been able to pin one down. The question grabbed so much attention that David Hilbert, the rock star mathematician of the early 1900s, made it the very first entry on his famous list of 23 problems for the next century to solve. But what followed wasn't a neat solution. In the 1940s, Kurt Gödel showed that math would stay consistent if you assumed the hypothesis was true. Decades later, Paul Cohen showed the same thing if you assumed it was false. The Happy Ending Problem Back in the 1930s, a group of Hungarian mathematicians liked tossing puzzles around in cafes. One of them, Esther Klein, asked a simple geometry question. If you put five points anywhere on a flat surface, are you guaranteed to find four that form a neat convex quadrilateral? In plain English, that just means no matter how you scatter five dots on a page, you can always connect four of them into a four-sided shape where all the corners stick out, like a normal box or kite, not a shape that bends inward. Turns out, yes, no matter how scattered the points are, four of them will always connect into a shape that doesn't cave in. Her friends, Paul Erdo and George Sequeiras, pushed the idea further. What if you want a bigger polygon? With six points, you're guaranteed a triangle. With nine points, you can form a convex hexagon. Keep adding points, and sooner or later, you're forced to see order appear out of chaos. And that's the real mystery. We know these guarantees exist, but no one has hmm. figured out the exact formula for large shapes. For example, how many points would you need to guarantee a convex 20-sided polygon? Mathematicians still don't know. Thank you.